Good morning, and welcome to the Chesapeake Food Shed Network Coffee Talk Series, Learning and Connecting for Action. My name is Christy Gabbard, and I'm the owner of Local Concepts, a consulting firm which provides the development and coordination support for the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. I'm joining you today from Southwest Virginia, where it's a great spring day, and uh, the weather looks wonderful, and I'm also joined by my Local Concepts team member, Jonas Sipos who is leading our program development and is participating from Maryland. Before jumping into the coffee talk, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. The network is comprised of a group of organizations, businesses, funders, and agencies, as well as other change agents working across the Chesapeake watershed to build a stronger and more resilient food system. We are a relatively new initiative, about a year and a half in the making. And the leadership group that spurred the network's development did so because they recognized that there is a great deal of extraordinary work being done to advance our regional food system, but that there was no entity intentionally trying to build connections, trust, and relationships among those out there doing the work. Our mission is to catalyze connections and collaborations that help build a sustainable, resilient, inclusive and equitable regional food system in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We believe by catalyzing connections and collaborations, we are stronger together and we can help to accelerate change in our food system faster. This is a picture of our network building blocks and essentially they are what we call the, well, like I said, they are our network building blocks. And if you look at the bottom of this pyramid, that's what serves as the foundation of our uh, our network. It, and it's all about building connections, about getting to know one another, sharing information and knowledge, building relationships and trust. And the thought is that as we know one another better, as we have more, as we share more information, we might over time the opportunities to align and to work collectively towards action. We invite anyone that supports our vision of a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system to participate in the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. The Coffee Talks are a platform that the network has developed to help catalyze connections around specific food system topics. The idea is to partner with a resource expert to provide a quick learning opportunity through the webinar, and then during the webinar and in, and in follow-up materials, we identify ways for people to continue to engage and to dig in deeper around that food system topic. We are using today's coffee talk as a way to raise awareness and begin to build alignment around regional opportunities and gaps and to begin to set the stage for developing a vision that we can all work collectively towards. The Chesapeake Food Shed Network is currently engaging stakeholders to develop and implement a food system vision for the Chesapeake region. Because agriculture is the biggest source of pollution in the Chesapeake Bay, and there is already a concerted regional effort to tackle the water quality problems in the Bay, we have used the Chesapeake Watershed, which is shown here, to define our region. As you can see, the watershed comprises portions of six states and Washington, D.C. We think a regional approach will not only enable us to better tackle agriculture-related pollution in the Bay, it will also better enable us to tackle other pressing problems such as hunger, food waste, and economic vitality of food-based jobs. This webinar is part of a series of learning and engagement opportunities for developing a food system vision for the Chesapeake region. The assessment that we are going to hear about, along with the findings from a regional summit that the network held in January, are being used as a starting point to help frame our collective work moving forward. If you want to be involved with the vision development process, we invite you to reach out to us by email or visit our website and click on Get Involved. I'd also like to bring to your attention a couple handouts available to you in the GoToWebinar control panel. They will further describe the Chesapeake Food Shed Network and our efforts developing a regional food system vision. And you'll also find a copy of the full assessment that we are going to hear about 
momentarily. So with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Arabella Advisors so we can learn more about their findings. If you have any questions, you can type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. At the end of the presentation, Arabella has also prepared a number of leading questions for you to consider. Yona will be collecting your questions and will share them with Arabella after the presentation. After this webinar, we will share a recording of the presentations and a copy of the a PDF copy of the slides. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric Kessler, who's the founder of Arabella Advisors and head of Arabella's Food System Practice. Thrilled to uh, be with you all this morning. Thanks for everyone dialing in. I've been a lifelong uh, uh, resident for, um, I guess, uh, nearly 25, 25 years of the Chesapeake Bay Food Shed, and uh, it's an honor to have been a part of this project um, uh, with you all. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with Arabella Advisors. We're a, um, a mid-sized uh, uh, consulting company that supports philanthropists and foundations and corporate donors and impact investors across a wide range of issues. But over the last uh, um, 10 years, we've had a growing interest among our clients in, um, in good food systems, which led us to launch a good food practice, a team that's dedicated just to working on um, issues related to um, health, nutrition, sustainability, affordability, accessibility in our, in our food system. And under that practice, um, uh, we've had the great opportunity to work with Christie and, um, uh, and the Town Creek Foundation and the Washington Regional Food Funders Group. Um, Kaiser Permanente and others um, to do this work. Um, uh, as part of our food practice, we um, uh, uh, provide strategic guidance to large institutional foundations. We evaluate um, uh, uh, large in, uh, investment and philanthropic portfolios. We um, uh, manage impact investments um, in the food system for clients. And, um, and notably, we're working in a number of regions to help um, assess and design regional food systems. Um, uh, and that brings us to the work today. Our overall approach to the food system um, had, has led us to think about a framework of really the, what we think is the three sort of key ingredients to good food. Um, uh, and, um, and, and those are culture, policy, and infrastructure. And I raise this now because you'll see this as uh, my colleagues start to dig into our work in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, uh, culture being um, all of the work that needs to be done to uh, increase consumer demand, to educate consumers, um, and engage consumers in, um, in good food conversations and the good food demand side of the equation. Um, infrastructure, meaning all of the investments that need to be made um, on the investment side, on the, on the business side to meet that demand. Um, and then finally, policy change, which, um, which uh, enables us to codify the change that we're making on supply and demand, um, get policies out of the way of good food systems, and um, where necessary, put policies in place that support it. And so, these we see as the three key ingredients. You can't have a good food a good food system without the three of them. You can't have the Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake Food Shed. Can't be a good food system without all three of these ingredients working together. Um, and and we're pleased to sort of bring that approach to this work. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, we, we, at Arabelle, we've had a, a big team of people working on this effort for many months now, um, uh, um, uh, led by my colleagues Ryan Strode, who co-leads Arabella's food practice with me, um, uh, Lauren MacArthur, and Elizabeth Weiner, um, and uh, I'm going to now turn it over to our project lead, uh, Lauren MacArthur, who's going to um, uh, give an overview of the work that we've done. So, Lauren, over to you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone can hear me and see the screen. Um, we are today going to share findings from a landscape analysis that Arabella conducted of current strategies and initiatives to strengthen the regional uh, food system in the Chesapeake Bay watershed region. Um, I think, as Eric mentioned, this work was supported by Town Creek Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, and Washington Regional Food Funders. Um, what we found is that there's a tremendous array of food system initiatives that have emerged across the region that really constitute a growing movement to build a stronger, more equitable, more sustainable, and thriving regional food system. The work that's being done is really exciting and it's having an impact. Um, at the same time, 
there are some crucial gaps and challenges in the landscape. And by zeroing in on these gaps and challenges, our goal with this assessment uh, is really to help food funders, advocates, and other stakeholders align their strike priorities in the most strategic way and, and be able to direct their resources to the greatest needs as well as the most promising opportunities for strengthening the regional food system. Um, we structured uh, our analysis around a triple bottom line, um, and this is consistent with um, an approach that the Food Shed Network has taken in the past. Um, looking at food system efforts that were focused on promoting social equity and food access, advancing environmental sustainability, and building a, a stronger regional food economy. We recognize that these categories are interrelated, and so a number of initiatives that we identified in our landscape have impacted more than one of these three areas. Um, our findings and research are really rooted in uh, stakeholder interviews that we conducted. We interviewed close to 30 stakeholders across the region, including funders, uh, producers, food system uh, stakeholders and entrepreneurs, public health experts, environmental experts, among others. We also um, presented some preliminary findings at the Chesapeake Food Shed Network's regional summit uh, in January and incorporated input from about 100 stakeholders from that event as well. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Liz Weiner, um, who's going to present now a very brief sketch of some of the notable food system initiatives and strategies that we identified in our landscape analysis. And then we're going to talk about, um, um, there, there's a lot more that you'll find in the report, which I think has been, um, that you've received a link to. We're not going to cover everything, but we're going to give you a bit of a snapshot. Then we're really going to zero in in this presentation on some of the more notable challenges and some recommendations for how, how to address those challenges. Thanks, Lauren. So as Lauren mentioned, um, these next few slides are going to highlight the primary types of initiatives and strategies that we, we found through our research that are being implemented in the region to strengthen the food system. We categorize them according to whether they focus primarily on social equity, environmental sustainability, or the food economy. And you know what we're going to present here today only scratches the surface of the great work that's being done across the region. You can find more information in our report. Um, but I'm going to highlight a few exciting programs that are, that are starting out on this important work. So the first area of focus we looked at was social equity and food access. There are individuals and organizations working diligently to increase access to nutritious food by implementing creative ways to make it easier for people to eat good food at home and in schools. Stakeholders mentioned projects that connect schools, churches, hospitals, and community centers with local farms as well as a lot of programs that help low-income residents stretch their food budgets through SNAP programs or vouchers or other economic supports that help people buy food and bring it home. Some programs have even started to look at food's role in preventative health with doctors prescribing vouchers that can be used at farmers markets instead of prescribing medication to treat conditions like hypertension or diabetes. One exciting initiative that we wanted to highlight is the Black Church Food Security Network. It's a community group which is working to bring together black churches and black farmers to provide nutritious food at churches and in communities. The organization has been working across a number of fronts. They created an urban garden in the yard of the Pleasant Hope Church in Baltimore, um, which produced more than 500 pounds of produce last year. They also are working with local farmers to sell fruits and vegetables after worship services, forging direct connections from the farm to the community and meeting people in the spaces where they're already congregated. While there's been a diverse array of these food access programs and they're doing a great job at reaching large numbers of people in the region, people are still struggling to access them for a variety of reasons. Um, programs like SNAP are means tested so those who fall just above the qualifying income levels are ineligible. And for many, the level of benefits that they receive just aren't sufficient to meet their levels of need. The next area of focus is the environment and environmental sustainability. Um, through our research and our landscape, we identified four primary types of initiatives that promote environmental sustainability within the region. There are initiatives which regulate and enforce pollution controls, 
which are necessary, especially looking to control the amount of pollution coming out of industry and large-scale organizations. But these measures are not well necessary. They're not sufficient for ensuring environmental sustainability. We also looked at other initiatives which focus on supporting farmers as they transition to more sustainable practices. Those programs looked at trainings and financial supports that can help make those transitions easier. Additionally, we found that demand for sustainable products really helps to incentivize farmers to transition as well when they see ripe business opportunities awaiting them when they transition practices. Additionally, uh, food recovery and waste diversion programs do important work in keeping food out of landfills. One example of this is, a, is the DC Central Kitchen which recovered over 800,000 pounds of food in 2014, which saved the organization more than $200,000 in food costs for their programs from this donated produce, and it also prevented that food from ending up in landfills. These and other current waste diversion programs are incredibly promising, but there's a need to scale them and to better integrate them with trash and recycling systems. They're still quite small. The last area of focus is the regional food economy. There are many initiatives that are aimed at strengthening this food system. Some focus on increasing demand, others focus on building the supply chain infrastructure. Direct-to-consumer sales have exploded across the region through farmers markets, community-supported agriculture products, direct-to-consumer delivery services, and other innovative ways to get, farm straight, to get food straight from farms to consumers. Other programs have focused on building infrastructure to help small farmers aggregate and distribute their products to achieve economies of scale. There, are, there has been a lot of interest and movement in building food hubs that can help small farmers compete with the larger farms. Additionally, programs are looking to support farmers in accessing affordable land in both rural and urban environments through programs that um, help people find affordable leasing, leasing of land or urban initiatives that provide tax abatements or other um, projects. One particular area of growth has been the increase in institutional purchasers who have committed to sourcing from local and sustainable farms. Universities have been at the forefront of this. One example, which everyone who attended the Regional Food Summit in January got the opportunity to see, is that the University of Maryland's Dining Services developed a sustainable food action plan in 2012. They set the goal of purchasing 20% of food served on campus from sustainable sources by 2020. They achieved that goal six years early in the fall of 2014 and continue to build on their program, which now prioritizes reusable and compostable materials for takeout service. And they divert almost 75% of their waste away from landfills through compost and recycling programs. With an annual budget of $50 million, this program is making a real impact on local purchasing. Again, I encourage you to read the full report if you're interested in digging deeper about the progress that's being made across the region and learning about more initiatives that are happening. Uh, Lauren is going to walk us through some of the challenges that have emerged through our research. Thanks, Liz. So uh, uh, the range of food system initiatives being undertaken in the region is impressive, and, and as Liz mentioned, you can find many more examples in our report, um, but we do want to talk about some of the more significant challenges that we identified that we think are, uh, based on the assessment, important to address in order to accelerate progress in the region. The first challenge is about promoting equity. A number of uh, stakeholders remark on the difficulty and challenge of finding a price point in the market that can both ensure access uh, uh, to, to food, to nutritious food for those in low-income communities, while also ensuring fair prices for producers and decent wages for food system workers. The economics of making that work are just fundamentally very challenging. Um, and so as a result, many of the food initiatives that we found in the landscape either focus on creating opportunities for producers or they're focused on increasing access for those in low-income communities but fewer are focused on promoting equity throughout the entire supply chain. Um, I think we think there's at least two takeaways uh, from this observation. Uh, the first is that a purely market-based approach um, may not be adequate for promoting equity in the food system. So we need to consider ways to subsidize food initiatives, 
either through governmental or charitable funding or through creative approaches and strategies such as tiered pricing. And second, it's important to recognize that inequities in the food system are linked to larger inequities in our communities. Um, so uh, it's important for those in the doing food system work who want to promote equity uh, to engage uh, in addressing some of these larger inequities. And they can do so by partnering with social justice organizations that are working to promote uh, job creation and affordable housing um, issues in, in, in poor communities. Um, a second and related challenge uh, is the need to elevate and engage the voices of those from disadvantaged communities in food system efforts. Um, a number of stakeholders noted that communities of color and low-income communities are underrepresented in food system efforts, and bringing their voices to the table is important for ensuring that issues of equity and access are prioritized in food system efforts, and that the unique needs of those communities are being addressed. Um, we also think that uh, engaging those communities is a way to build a more diverse and powerful base for advocacy efforts uh, related to the food system. Um, gathering data on the supply chain um, and, and, and enhancing coordination is another uh, critical challenge. Um, folks expressed concerns, for example, that as new food hubs are emerging, um, they may be targeting some of the same products to the same markets and, and oversaturating or duplicating effort. Or conversely, they may be missing some of the ripest market opportunities. Um, others talked about uh, the importance of coordinating for uh, ensuring efficiencies in transportation. For example, are local producers aware of when food, chip, food bank shipments are taking place where they could potentially uh, ship their products to markets? So we need more data and more research on the supply chain um, and what's happening and more coordination in order to maximize efficiencies. Um, engaging institutional markets is another critical challenge. Um, we found that there's been a huge growth in community supported agriculture initiatives, farmers markets, and other direct to consumer models. Um, and there has been some, uh, there is work that's being done um, to promote farm to institution um, programs. Um, however, institutional buyers really comprise the vast majority of the market, and so finding ways to help lo local producers tap and reach those markets at scale is, is a really critical challenge for strengthening the regional food account economy. And that's difficult. Um, these institutional purchasers have real financial constraints and that impede their ability to source from local producers. Um, and the final challenge that we want to highlight is the need to strengthen the advocacy capacity of those working to strengthen the food system here in the region. Um, transforming the food system is going to require policy change at multiple levels, from local to state and ultimately federal level. And that means building the political power of food system advocates. Um, advocates are doing great work, but they need training, resources for organizing and capacity building, and stronger and more powerful allies. So those are some of the key challenges that we identified. We developed also uh, some preliminary recommendations for how to uh, address some of those key challenges and gaps. Um, uh, first, we heard from many people across the region that there is a lot of interest uh, among folks who want to start new food businesses, whether it's some people who want to start farms, uh, open food trucks, develop commercial kitchens, create new food hubs. There's a lot of interest. Um, but people need access to capital um, and supports for uh, business development. Um, based on our national landscaping, we know that there is a growing interest among a variety of public and private investors in investing in regional food systems. And we think that within this region, funders and local governments can help catalyze investments by providing seed and matching funds for um, new initiatives, new food initiatives, and new food businesses supporting further research into what the current investment opportunities are is also uh, important and can help um, attract new capital to the region. Second, uh, we talked about the challenge of uh, tapping, uh, helping local producers tap institutional markets. Um, we think that engaging schools and hospitals in particular is a promising strategy for scaling the, the regional food system. Um, we think that these institutions are right targets for these efforts because they are potentially more receptive to public influence 
and while at the same time they have the resources and scale to reach a large uh, part of the, uh, to reach many people. Um, hospitals, for example, have community benefits funds that they can be using to support local food initiatives and they have a financial interest in um, preventing uh, and promoting healthy eating as a way to prevent diet-related uh, health conditions. Um, so this work would involve advocacy strategies that push schools and hospitals to adopt local procurement policies. We know and uh, talked about, Liz talked about some of the efforts that are already underway in that area, so this is a matter of amplifying and expanding upon those efforts I and mean, creating advocacy campaigns and programs that can be replicated. Um, at the same time, beyond advocacy, um, we need to recognize the very real financial pressures that are driving in these institutions' as purchasing decisions. Uh, and so advocacy alone is um, likely to have limits to it. Um, we also, there is also a need to um, continue investing in building out the supply chain infrastructure that can help local producers build the economies of scale they need to better compete on price uh, for these institutions' in business. Um, strengthening the advocacy capacity um, is another uh, recommendation. Um, there's a need for more resources for training, capacity building, um, for, for example, food policy councils. The food policy councils are a natural base for advocacy efforts, but many of them actually don't focus, really focus on policy advocacy, and I think the majority of them don't have any paid organizing staff. So funders in the region can help build the advocacy capacity of food policy councils and other advocacy and other food system groups uh, by providing funds to support staff and, and advocacy training. Um, uh, but we also think that partnerships and alliances are really important. Um, food system advocates can work to build partnerships with existing social justice organizations that do have the capacity to mobilize the grassroots and do have established political influence. Um, and there's potential for advocates to link food issues to broader issues that these organizations and the communities they, they serve care about, uh, such as job creation and neighborhood revitalization. Um, and the final recommendation is um, to increase statewide and regional uh, coordination. Uh, and the Chesapeake Food Jet Network uh, is an important vehicle and platform for, for fostering that type of coordination. Uh, regional coordination is important for a number of reasons. Um, it's important for advocacy. Uh, one, to build the scale and power that's really needed to be able to move a, a policy agenda at the state level and ultimately to contribute to federal policy change as well. Um, it's also important for advocacy that can harmonize some of the differing laws and regulations that exist across jurisdiction in the region uh, that are impeding uh, this uh, ability to scale the regional food economy. For example, there's different zoning regulations and license, licensing regulations that impact different food businesses. It makes it different, difficult for them to operate um, in multiple jurisdictions. So some level of regional coordination around advocacy is going to be necessary to, to work towards harmonizing those policies. Regional coordination is also important for collecting and sharing data on the regional supply chain. Um, again, so that, that um, food initiatives as they develop are really looking at the rightest mar market opportunities and maximizing efficiencies. And lastly, funders can also benefit from in enhanced regional coordination to make sure that their strategies and investments are aligned and they're avoiding duplication of efforts. Um, we're going to stop there and open up now for uh, questions. Um, and we encourage you to submit questions using the question toolbar rather than the chat toolbar. Um, that's where we're going to be kind of monitoring the questions. Um, and, you know, I think the first question is just we want to know if folks have questions, clarifying questions about our research or findings. Um, we're also interested in folks' thoughts on opportunities you see for putting these recommendations into action. Um, we recognize that the chat, this question chat format has some limitations for generating com conversation. Uh, but we'd like to hear some of your ideas for how to put these recommendations into action as well as your questions, and we'll do our best to consider and respond to them. So, thank you so much. That was great, Eric, Liz, and Lauren. And uh, 
Yeah, we invite you to go ahead and submit any questions that you have, and Yona is going to moderate those questions and share them with our presenters. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me? You sound great, Yona. Yep. Great. Okay. So I'll just run through some of the questions that have been posted already, and then we'll um, maybe see what, what uh, we need to highlight at the end of the discussion questions that you posted, Lauren, that haven't been addressed. Um, so Brian Hill asked the question, we have used community finance institutions to support rural economic development. Do you have recommendations how they might structure programs to address the capital needs, and do you have any examples? So we're just jumping right into it. Yeah. Um, we did not look in particular at CDFIs, um, and so we don't unfortunately have any specific um, example that we can provide um, in that area. I mean, I, one of the things that, uh, again, in, just in terms of the data collection and research, um, there are some efforts that are going on to, to more systematically map the supply chain, so I think that's an important dimension to this, um, to really understand kind of what the resources are and where the gaps are in the supply chain. That's really important for guiding investment, capital investments in the region um, in an important way, uh, in a strategic way. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I think the other thing is on, on the policy uh, level, um, you know, there are some state initiatives that are trying to increase financing to businesses and nonprofits. Uh, Maryland uh, launched a fresh food financing initiative in 2015 with some state funding that provides financing to businesses and nonprofits. So, you know, having broader support, you know, at the state level, um, I think is another important dimension to this as well. Um, and just generally, I think, um, you know, I think being able to map out where the investment opportunities are, as well as who the investors are, we've started to do some of this work at the at the national level, can help um, help you know bring capital into the region just merely by identifying where the needs are and where the opportunities are. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and uh, just a follow up question from Brian Hill that's in a bit of a, um, opening up another question as well. Um, he asks. Are there other regions in the country that you have seen which has caused you to say, wow, they have pulled together all the pieces in a very effective way? Some places is generally applicable and, um, and specialized, as well as specialized, I think it says. Um, is, are there any examples that you came across in your research that you would like to highlight at this time, basically? In terms of other regions in the country, I'm not sure that anybody has sort of pulled all the pieces together. I mean, I think. Uh, I know that in work in other regions, we have found that um, that folks are kind of struggling with similar challenges. Um, you know, New England is one of the regions which has done a lot of work on regional coordination um, that I know the Chesapeake Food Chain Network has looked to as a, as a model. Um, so, but I'm not aware of, of any sort of, sh you know, necessarily shining paradigms out there. Um, I don't know, Eric, if you have any thoughts on looking at sort of national scan, but I mean, what we see are really folks facing similar challenges. There's a lot of similar type of initiatives that are emerging, and I think, which is exciting, there's growing interest among funders um, uh, in food system work, and it cuts across multiple issues, um, and so there's a lot of potential, and, but, and, and there's been a lot of growth, but I think there's also continues to be um, you know, similar challenges that folks are, saying, are seeing. Lauren, I'll, uh, this is Eric Kessler. I'll chime in uh, as well to say that um, it's a great question. We're asking ourselves the same thing every day. Um, you know, we're working on similar sort of efforts in, in several regions in the Midwest and on the West Coast. Um, what we're finding is, lot, first, you know, these sorts of assessments and um, uh, inter regional food system planning is happening in, it appears, about 70 or 80 different um, sort of regions, metropolitan areas, some as big as the Chesapeake food sheds, some as small as um, St. Louis proper. Um, uh, and um, what we're seeing is bits and pieces of getting it right everywhere. Uh, um, but but the sad fact is, no, we haven't seen anyone that's sort of gotten it all right. I mean, certainly, as Lauren pointed out, you know, New England and some other regions that have been working on this longer and have put more resources into it are certainly further along. But I think even some of those efforts would say they've got a long way to go. We hope that um, later this year we'll be able to um, uh, to sort of do this sort of landscape of sort of um, uh, um, 
what's happening where and where the um, where the sort of shining lights are, and hopefully we can then amalgamate that into sort of one big success story. But it is a ways off for sure. Thank you so much, both Lauren and Eric. Um, and uh, you, you, I think, addressed this next question already, but I'll still pose it. Neoma Roman asked, would it be possible to work with CFN or Arabella to direct our local efforts? And I think I heard you saying that, you know, you work with a lot of, um, a lot of different scales of um, places across the country. And so I'll, I'll leave, it, uh, ask if you have anything else to add, but it seems like there are lots of possibilities for this work. Yeah, I think we I think we would welcome conversations about um, particular local efforts. And, and and Lauren, it's Eric again, and I'll just add as well that um, uh, and I know we appreciate that question. And 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 the bigger point is that um, uh, you know whether it's us or you or or Chrissy or somebody else, um, um, this sort of work doesn't happen if it's not sort of directed and coordinated. And so um, so having some level of coordination, whether it's a point of whether it's a singular point of contact or a coalition. Um, obviously, that's what the you know the Food Chat Network is. Uh, you know, it's part of um, what the Food Chat Network is set up to do. Um, but we do think that sort of driving timelines, driving action, driving decisions um, is going to be really critical if we want to make progress on this stuff. Somebody needs to play that role in a very sort of directive directive way and um, uh, and and thankfully in the region there's lots of lots of players and lots of tools who I think would um, uh, that could be used to, to, to get that done and um, obviously um, you know if, if there's an opportunity for us to help with that we'd be thrilled but but most importantly it's just that it gets done by uh, by whoever's available yeah this is Chris I'll add mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that just quickly is to say you know at the Chesapeake Beach network we really see our role in helping to catalyze connections across the region, you know, connecting people who are doing similar work, but also we see this assessment as sort of laying the groundwork or providing some framework for some, some framework for focused action. And um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few minutes. But we definitely want to work with groups like the Midshore Coalition that Naoma is. Uh, managing and other groups to not only connect them with others doing similar work, but to say this is some um, great work. We should learn from their practices. And this is where it aligns with a regional effort to drive towards a, a vision of reform for our food system. And so again, this assessment is kind of one of the initial steps in getting a better understanding of what the current landscape is in the food system. It's done a really fantastic job of identifying some of the things that are working and where there are some challenges and gaps. And we will look at, in just a few minutes, some of the kind of key focus areas that we've found through this assessment process and at a summit that we held in January. Um, so that's just some of my thinking in response to Naomi's question. And, and, and I think Eric and, and Lauren pointed to this, that it, it really is going to take a collective effort. And what we are trying to do with the network is not to duplicate effort, but rather try to bring the effort together so that we can be stronger together. Thank you so much, all of you. And Christy, um, I'll, I'll just note this other comment for now, or question and comment, and maybe you have more to add now, or maybe it's um, for the later part that we'll transition to in a few minutes. Will Gray um, shared the need for regional coordination around food systems development, whether it's new food hubs and businesses, farm advocacy, or supply chain logistics, seems to be a recurring theme in the regionalization of local food. But who is the right agent for that kind of coordination? Policy councils are great, but they're often opt-in volunteer engagements and politically appointed groups come and go with election cycles. Who else has the vantage point necessary to be effective at this kind of coordination? And of course, um, Arabella, Keen, you know, if you have um, uh, what to add, please jump in as well. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly, I think that the Chesapeake Food Shed Network has a role as a convener for regional coordination um, uh, around supply chain development, and I think uh, is looking at developing some working groups that would look at, at that. 
Um, another kind of model that we found in our landscape um, is um, uh, is being is something that the Washington Council of Governments has set up, which is a value chain coordinator. Um, it, it got support from, I think it was Prince Charitable Trust or local funders in the USDA. And so they have a value chain coordinator whose specific role it is, it, it, they call it sort of the development of soft infrastructure. And their specific role is to help producers in the region build relationships with relevant stakeholders throughout the, the supply chain. Um, so that's another um, potential model. Um, and um, you know, I'm not sure that there's one, you know, one single agent um, that can coordinate um, you know, all, all, of the, all of what's going on. It's a very diverse and dynamic uh, set of, um, of activities. Um, but um, I think that you know, by bringing funders together to coordinate their efforts, by investing in kind of research that, in data that can be shared, um, and through other things like these, you know, potentially looking at these value chain coordinator um, models, um, there are ways to enhance the level of coordination in, in ways that would help to scale the, the local supply chain and the regional food economy and, and create more efficiencies um, and more opportunities for producers in the region. Wonderful, great. We have, I'll just say that we have a lot of questions coming in, so I think we'll probably be able to get to maybe two more. Does that sound right? And then we'll, we'll move into the last part. But the rest of the questions will be collected and shared with Arabella Advisors and, um, and shared also with the group uh, who registered and who are here today. And so um, we'll see which we can address today and which maybe can be addressed after the webinar. Um, Cheryl Collin asks, uh, if you could say more about the needs and opportunities about connecting food recovery efforts to existing supply chain infrastructure, specifically food distributors and the concept of backhauling. And then uh, another question that's um, in the same, similar vein, how can we at the local level work towards supporting federal reg legislation on the Food Recovery Act? Both questions by Cheryl Collins. Yeah. Um, in terms of food recovery, um, there are a few programs that we point to in our report um, that are doing this type of work. Um, there is um, Peninsula Food Runners who set up a communication system um, in Montgomery County. So they're alerted to food waste and then they pick them up um, and then they distribute it to a volunteer network through a volunteer network of food banks um, in the region. Um, in terms of backhauling, um, yeah. it, it, we talked to some folks, I think it was at the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture, that were really interested in creating hub and spoke kind of networks and distribution systems. Um, so, I mean, there are folks that are interested in that as a efficient model um, that can help local producers kind of achieve economies of scale. Um, and, um, and, and, and it can be set up, I mean, the sort of capital requirements for setting up a hub and spoke system, um, they can be sort of phased in. Um, so I, I think there is interest in, in those types of models in the system, uh, in, in the region. Um, and, you know, I think that there's potential to catalyze further conversations about, about that. Um, so there are the promising work that's being done on, on food recovery, um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think in Maryland, it's something like only 10% of um, food waste is sort of composted. So there's still an enormous amount of food waste that's going into landfill. Um, and um, and so, uh, so there's a lot of challenges there, but a lot of, I think, potential opportunities. Um, and then the, the other question was about the Food Recovery Act. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Eric, yeah, do you me, have any thoughts on federal policy? Let me here. I just, if you look at the uh, chat window on your screen, you'll see I just posted a link to um, a report that I'm helping to launch um, today here in Stanford, here at Stanford in uh, California, um, uh, which is a um, almost a year-long effort um, by a number of funders and um, and uh, um, and advocacy organizations focused on food waste and food recovery. Um, check it out inside the report. I put the link on there. Um, uh, is um, a number of very specific, very concrete actions um, related to food recovery and food waste reduction. Um, uh, with us today 
will be Shelley Pingree, who of course um, uh, has authored um, uh, legislation focused on uh, on food waste recovery and um, uh, and a big focus of the conversation today here at Stanford, which I'll be facilitating, is around sort of policy change, um, mostly around date labeling, um, uh, but also around incentives um, uh, uh, for food recovery. So. Um, um, I'm going to punt on the question and say, check out um, this report, um, and if you're interested, let me know. I'll be sure to send you updates from uh, from uh, this discussions here with some policy leaders um, uh, and uh, uh, focused on all this legislation. There's a lot going on and a lot of very specific concrete action, and it appears from the attendance of this event today, um, a lot of donor interest in stepping up to um, support organizations that want to work on this, so we're excited about that. Great, and I would just add that based also on the on the questions that are continuing to roll in, there is a lot of interest in continuing this conversation. Um, so maybe uh, I'll close the question and answer period with just a comment, and then um, say again that we'll share the rest of the questions so that they're not they won't be lost. And I apologize that we couldn't get through more today. Um, a message from Lauren Beal. This is a comment. DC Greens is thrilled by this analysis, and we are already thinking about how to map out current work in relation to this framework. We can all amplify by incorporating it into our work. Um, and I'll just say that that might link in, and, and spending a bit more time with the report might also provide, um, you know, the, the links that you provided in the report will allow folks, hopefully, to follow those and respond to some of the other questions that you had about um, tools that other regions are using, and current food equity approaches that are used within different industries throughout the region and other regions across the U.S. Um, questions about coordination, again, have come up in a few different ways, and maybe that's a good place to just pause the Q&A here and um, say thank you again to everybody, the, the uh, registrants and the, part and the presenters, and I'll pass it over to Christy now. Mm, thank you so much. Really fantastic questions, um, and it's just speaks to the need to, as Yona has said, to continue this conversation. Um, thank you so much for the great input to all of the attendees today. What we wanted to share with you at this point was um, just what the Chesapeake Food Shed Network is, how we're going to potentially use the work that Arabella has done, as well as the assessment findings. Um, and so again, the network is using this assessment to get a better understanding of the current landscape of the food system. Um, it is, you see this as a starting point for developing a regional vision for the Chesapeake Food Shed. And, uh, you know, as I've already said, we really think that if we work together that we can accelerate the pace of change faster and um, faster towards a vision that supports sustainable, um, inclusive, and a resilient food system. So we want you to get involved, to join us. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you are involved with. We do think this really starts with building relationships and um, sharing information. That said, uh, you know, we are, again, using this assessment as a starting point for uh, as a starting point for work towards that vision. And this is kind of a proposed process. We're still we're still refining this process, but this is what we've sketched out so far just to give you a sense of how we've got to where we are today and where we hope to go. Um, so we have been collecting, the Chesapeake Food Shed Network has been collecting and reviewing food plans from across the region. We shared those with Ella, Ella Arabella to inform their assessment. And we also held a summit to gather feedback, as I've mentioned, on Arabella's initial, initial findings and to gauge interest in and feedback and get feedback on the ideas of developing a regional vision. So we are essentially assimilating all of that and for all of that information. And, um, and from that, we have identified a few key focus areas that we think might be right for developing uh, regional action plans. And so that we think these focus areas might be right for pulling together a team of leaders, and those leaders could work on action plans that might identify strategic priorities to move forward, um, to move change in different focus areas, but also would identify policy needs, funding needs, and research needs. And then these action plans could be put together into a regional strategy map that would really show how all of our collective work is is moving uh, is, is, is 
creating change and moving towards a uh, reformed food system. So we, as I said, we have taken a stat. We think that we've identified some areas right for a focused area for a concentrated effort. But we do want to hear from you, and um, we want to hear from you and see see what you think. So we've created a quick poll to help gauge this group thinking. And I'm going to put that up here now. And uh, essentially, let us know which focus area you feel is most in need of attention for food system reform. Throughout this process, we really do want to create ways to hear from um, leaders to hear from all of the great organizations, the businesses, the decision makers out there that are trying to move the dial on, and change our food system. And uh, so we will use features like this, the webinar, the polling feature, surveys, to get a better sense of, of where, um, of your thoughts and what we can be doing uh, to help support your efforts. So I'm going to close this poll. and. Basically, we got 20% of the people felt that there was a real need to focus on farm to institution, 14% on food recovery, 45% on the supply chain infrastructure, and 11% on access to land for production. So that's very helpful. Um, thank you for sharing that. And then I just want to double check that my screen is still able to be viewed. Yes, you're on next steps. OK, super. So again, um, part of the Coffee Talk platform is to identify ways for people to be connected in it, um, around different food system topics, but also to be engaged after the webinar. And as I've said, we see this assessment as an important initial step in working to develop a regional vision. And we'd really like for you to join us. So we have outlined a few different ways that we um, hope that you will uh, that you will connect. One is we will follow up this webinar with the slide deck. I know I saw that you guys missed the first uh, handful of slides that I presented. So we'll share a slide deck with you that will have those slides as well as a recording to this webinar. But in that follow-up email we'll, where we will share that information, we will also have a survey that will be used um, to, again, to hear from you so that we can uh, take that those findings and help inform the development of the vision. We really encourage you to tell people about the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. Tell us how we can help um, provide more connectivity to the work that you're doing with others in the region. And share this webinar with your colleagues and your friends. If you visit our website, we have a place for you where you can sign up to join our email list. Uh, we don't send out a ton of email through this, about five a month, but it is a way for us to keep you up to date on upcoming region-wide events, on policy alerts, and on um, new resources that are coming out of all of the, the great work that's happening across the region. We will also use this as a place to share progress, including ways for you to plug in with the development of a regional vision. And lastly, at the summit, we had um, a request for the network to provide a way for people to share the projects that they are working on. And so if you go to our website and click on uh, the Get Involved tab, there is a place there for you to enter your project descriptions and where we have, uh, where we are sharing other projects that folks are working on from across the region. So these are just a handful of ways for you to continue to be involved with the network. We really do want to hear from you. So. Um, let us know what you're up to, who you are, and, um, and stay connected with us. And, and let us know how we can assist your efforts. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank you all for attending the Coffee Talk today. Thank you for bearing with us through the technical difficulties. We appreciate that. Um, we do invite you to, uh, if you would like to use the Coffee Talk platform to engage a broader audience, we invite you to contact us and let us know how we can um, get you set up to do a presentation, a webinar where, you, where we will broadcast it across the region and in some cases to national audiences like, as, like today. 
We have a couple of coffee talks that are coming up in April and May that I'd like to bring to your attention. One is April 5th. Um, this is with the American Heart Association on making the healthy choice, making healthy eating choices. And, uh, and then the other is with uh, Cheryl Collin, who joined us today as an attendee. She's going to be presenting on the community food rescue uh, work to feed more and waste less. And they have pulled together a food recovery matching tool that I think was mentioned earlier in this webinar that she's going to share um, through the Coffee Talk platform. If you're interested in those webinars, please visit our website to sign up. And again, we thank you for attending today. We will follow up with the questions, um, answers to your questions, as well as uh, the, the presentation link and the PDF of the slides. Hope you all have a wonderful day.